Chapters 62 through 65 of the Autobiography of Benvenuto Cellini, Volume 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Morgan Scorpion. The Autobiography of Benvenuto Cellini, Volume 1, translated by John Addington Simmons. Chapters 62 through 65. 62. No sooner had the governor returned, together with the procurator from the palace, than he sent for me, and spoke to this effect. Benvenuto, I am certainly sorry to come back from the Pope with such commands as I have received. You must either produce the chalice on the instant, or look to your affairs. Then I replied that, inasmuch as I had never to that hour believed a holy vicar of Christ could commit an unjust act, so I should like to see it before I did believe it. Therefore do the utmost that you can. The governor rejoined, I have to report a couple of words more from the Pope to you, and then I will execute the orders given me. He says that you must bring your work to me here, and that after I have seen it, put into a box and sealed, I must take it to him. He engages his word not to break the seal, and to return the piece to you untouched. But this much he wants to have done, in order to preserve his own honour in the affair. In return to this speech, I answered laughing, that I would very willingly give up my work, in the way he mentioned, because I should be glad to know for certain what a Pope's word was really worth. Accordingly, I sent for my piece, and having had it sealed as described, gave it up to him. The governor repaired again to the Pope, who took the box, according to what the governor himself told me, and turned it several times about. Then he asked the governor if he had seen the work, and he replied that he had, and that it had been sealed up in his presence, and added that it had struck him as a very admirable piece. Thereupon the Pope said, You shall tell Benvenuto that Popes have authority to bind and loose things of far greater consequence than this. And while thus speaking he opened the box with some show of anger, taking off the string and seals with which it was done up. Afterwards he paid it for long detention, and as I subsequently heard, showed it to Tobia the goldsmith, who bestowed much praise upon it. Then the Pope asked him if he felt equal to producing a piece in that style. On his saying, yes, the Pope told him to follow it out exactly, then turned to the governor and said, see whether Benvenuto will give it up, for if he does, he shall be paid the value fixed on it by men of knowledge in this art, but if he is really bent on finishing it himself, let him name a certain time, and if you are convinced that he means to do it, let him have all the reasonable accommodations he may ask for. The governor replied, Most blessed father, I know the violent temper of this young man, so let me have authority to give him a sound rating after my own fashion. The Pope told him to do what he liked with words, though he was sure he would make matters worse, and if at last he could do nothing else, he must order me to take the five hundred crowns to his jeweller, Pompeo. The governor returned, sent for me into his cabinet, and casting one of his catchpole's glances, began to speak as follows. Popes have authority to loose and bind the whole world, and what they do is immediately ratified in heaven. Behold your box, then, which has been opened and inspected by His Holiness. I lifted up my voice at once and said, I thank God that now I have learned and can report what the faith of Popes is made of. Then the governor launched out into brutal bullying words and gestures, but perceiving that they came to nothing, he gave up his attempt as desperate, and spoke in somewhat milder tones after this wise. Benvenuto, I am very sorry that you are so blind to your own interest, but since it is so, go and take the five hundred crowns, when you think fit, to Pompeo. I took my piece up, went away, and carried the crowns to Pompeo on the instant. It is most likely that the Pope had counted on some want of money or other opportunity preventing me from bringing so considerable a sum at once, and was anxious in this way to replace the broken thread of my obedience. When then he saw Pompeo coming to him with a smile upon his lips and the money in his hand, he soundly rated him, and lamented that the affair had turned out so. Then he said, Go find Benvenuto in his shop, and treat him with all the courtesies of which your ignorant and brutal nature is capable and tell him that if he is willing to finish that piece for a reliquary to hold the corpus domini when I walk in procession, I will allow him the conveniences he wants in order to complete it, 
providing only that he goes on working. Pompeo came to me, called me out of his shop, and heaped on me the most mawkish caresses of a donkey, reporting everything the Pope had ordered. I lost no time in answering that the greatest treasure I could wish for in the world was to regain the favour of so great a Pope, which had been lost to me, not indeed by my fault, but by the fault of my overwhelming illness, and the wickedness of those envious men who take pleasure in making mischief. And since the Pope has plenty of servants, do not let him send you round again, if you value your life. Nay, look well to your safety. I shall not fail, by night or day, to think and do everything I can in the Pope's service, and bear this well in mind, that when you have reported these words to His Holiness, you never in any way whatever meddle with the least of my affairs, for I will make you recognize your errors by the punishment they merit. The fellow related everything to the Pope, but in far more brutal terms than I had used, and thus the matter rested for a time while I again attended to my shop and business. 63. Tobia the goldsmith, meanwhile, worked at the setting and the decoration of the unicorn's horn. The Pope, moreover, commissioned him to begin the chalice upon the model he had seen in mine. But when Tobia came to show him what he had done, he was very discontented, and greatly regretted that he had broken with me, blaming all the other man's works and the people who had introduced them to him, and several times Bacino della Croce came from him to tell me that I must not neglect the reliquary. I answered that I begged His Holiness to let me breathe a little after the great illness I had suffered, and from which I was not as yet wholly free, adding that I would make it clear to him that all the hours in which I could work should be spent in his service. I had indeed begun to make his portrait, and was executing a medal in secret. I fashioned the steel dies for stamping this medal in my own house, whilst I kept a partner in my workshop, who had been my prentice and was called Felice. At that time, as is the want of young men, I had fallen in love with a Sicilian girl who was exceedingly beautiful. On it becoming clear that she returned my affection, her mother perceived how the matter stood, and grew suspicious of what might happen. The truth is that I had arranged to elope with the girl for a year to Florence, unknown to her mother, but she, getting wind of this, left Rome secretly one night, and went off in the direction of Naples. She gave out that she was gone by the Civita Vecchia, but she really went by Ostia. I followed them to Civita Vecchia, and did a multitude of mad things to discover her. It would be too long to narrate them all in detail, enough that I was on the point of losing my wits or dying. After two months she wrote to me that she was in Sicily, extremely unhappy. I meanwhile was indulging myself in all the pleasures man can think of, and had engaged in another love affair, merely to drown the memory of my real passion. 64. It happened through a variety of singular accidents that I became intimate with a Sicilian priest, who was a man of very elevated genius, and well instructed in both Latin and Greek letters. In the course of conversation one day we were led to talk about the art of necromancy, apropos of which I said, throughout my whole life I have had the most intense desire to see or learn something of this art. Thereto the priest replied, A stout soul and a steadfast must a man have who sets himself to such an enterprise. I answered that of strength and steadfastness of soul I should have enough and to spare, providing I found the opportunity. Then the priest said, If you have the heart to dare it, I will amply satisfy your curiosity. Accordingly we agreed upon attempting the adventure. The priest one evening made his preparations, and bade me find a comrade, or not more than two. I invited Vincenzio Romoli, a very dear friend of mine, and the priest took with him a native of Pistoja, who also cultivated the black art. We went together to the Colosseum, and there the priest, having arrayed himself in necromancer's robes, began to describe circles on the earth, with the finest ceremonies that can be imagined. I must say that he had made us bring precious perfumes and fire, and also drugs of fetid odour. When the preliminaries were completed, he made the entrance into the circle, and taking us by the hand, introduced us one by one inside it. Then he assigned our several functions. To the necromancer, his comrade, he gave the pentacle to hold. The other two of us had to look after the fire and the perfumes, and then he began his incantations. This lasted more than an hour and a half, when several legions appeared, and the Colosseum was all full of devils. I was occupied with the precious perfumes, and when the priest perceived in what numbers they were present, he turned to me and said, 
Benvenuto, ask them something. I called on them to reunite me with my Sicilian Angelica. That night we obtained no answer, but I enjoyed the greatest satisfaction of my curiosity in such matters. The necromancer said that we should have to go a second time, and that I should obtain the full accomplishment of my request, but he wished me to bring with me a little boy of pure virginity. I chose one of my shop lads, who was about twelve years old, and invited Vincenzo Romoli again, and we also took a certain Agnolino Gaddi, who was a very intimate friend of both. When we came once more to the place appointed, the necromancer made just the same preparations, attended by the same and even more impressive details. Then he introduced us into the circle, which he had reconstructed with art more admirable and yet more wondrous ceremonies. Afterwards he appointed my friend Vincenzio to the ordering of the perfumes and the fire, and with him Agnolino Gaddi. He next placed in my hand the pentacle, which he bid me turn towards the points he indicated, and under the pentacle I held the little boy, my workman. Now the necromancer began to utter those awful invocations, calling by name on multitudes of demons who are captains of their legions, and these he summoned by the virtue and potency of God, the uncreated, living and eternal, in phrases of the Hebrew, and also of the Greek and Latin tongues, insomuch that in a short space of time the whole Colosseum was full of a hundredfold as many as had appeared upon the first occasion. Vincenzo Romoli, together with Agnolino, tended the fire and heaped on quantities of precious perfumes. At the advice of the necromancer, I again demanded to be reunited with Angelica. The sorcerer turned to me and said, Hear you what they have replied, that in the space of one month you will be where she is. Then once more he prayed me to stand firm by him, because the legions were a thousandfold more than he had summoned, and were the most dangerous of all the denizens of hell. And now that they had settled what I asked, it behoved us to be civil to them and dismiss them gently. On the other side, the boy who was beneath the pentacle, shrieked out in terror that a million of the fiercest men were swarming round and threatening us. He said, moreover, that four huge giants had appeared, who were striving to force their way inside the circle. Meanwhile the necromancer, trembling with fear, kept doing his best with mild and soft persuasions to dismiss them. Vincenzo Romoli, who quaked like an aspen leaf, looked after the perfumes, though I was quite as frightened as the rest of them. I tried to show it less, and inspired them all with marvellous courage. But the truth is that I had given myself up for dead when I saw the terror of the necromancer. The boy had stuck his head between his knees, exclaiming, This is how I will meet death, for we are certainly dead men. Again I said to him, These creatures are all inferior to us, and what you see is only smoke and shadow, so then raise your eyes. When he had raised them, he cried out, The whole Colosseum is in flames, and the fire is advancing on us. Then covering his face with his hands, he groaned again that he was dead, and that he could not endure the sight longer. The necromancer appealed for my support, entreating me to stand firm by him, and to have Asafetida flung upon the coals. So I turned to Vincenzo Romoli, and told him to make the fumigation at once. While uttering these words I looked at Agnolino Gaddi, whose eyes were staring from their sockets in his terror, and who was more than half dead, and said to him, Agnolo, in a time and place like this we must not yield to fright, but do the utmost to bestir ourselves. Therefore, up at once and fling a handful of that asafetida upon the fire. Agnolo, at that moment when he moved to do this, let fly such a volley from his breech, that it was far more effectual than the asafetida. The boy, roused by that great stench and noise, lifted his face little, and hearing me laugh, he plucked up courage, and said the devils were taking to flight tempestuously. So we abode this until the matin bells began to sound. Then the boy told us again that but few remained, and those were at a distance. When the necromancer had concluded his ceremonies, he put off his wizard's robe, and packed up a great bundle of books, which he had brought with him. Then, altogether, we issued with him from the circle, huddling as close as we could to one another, especially the boy, who had got into the middle, and taken the necromancer by his gown, and me by the cloak. All the while that we were going toward our houses in the Banshee, he kept saying that two of the devils he had seen in the Colosseum were gambling in front of us, skipping now along the roofs, and now upon the ground. The necromancer assured me that, often as he had entered magic circles, he had never met with such a serious affair as this. He also tried to persuade me to assist him in consecrating a book, 
by means of which we should extract immeasurable wealth, since we could call up fiends to show us where treasures were, whereof the earth is full, and after this wise we should become the richest of mankind. Love affairs like mine were nothing but vanities and follies without consequence. I replied that if I were a Latin scholar I should be very willing to do what he suggested. He continued to persuade me by arguing that Latin scholarship was of no importance, and that, if he wanted, he could have found plenty of good Latinists, but that he had never met with a man of soul so firm as mine, and that I ought to follow his counsel. Engaged in this conversation, we reached our homes, and each one of us dreamed all that night of devils. 65. As we were in the habit of meeting daily, the necromancer kept urging me to join in his adventure. Accordingly, I asked him how long it would take, and where we should have to go. To this he answered that we might get through with it in less than a month, and that the most suitable locality for the purpose was the hill country of Norcia. A master of his in the art had indeed consecrated such a book quite close to Rome, at a place called the Badia di Farfa, but he had met with some difficulties there, which would not occur in the mountains of Norcia. The peasants also of that district are people to be trusted, and have some practice in these matters, so that at a pinch they are able to render valuable assistance. This priestly sorcerer moved me so by his persuasions that I was well disposed to comply with his request, but I said I wanted first to finish the medals I was making for the Pope. I had confided what I was doing about them to him alone, begging him to keep my secret. At the same time I never stopped asking him if he believed that I should be reunited to my Sicilian Angelica at the time appointed, for the date was drawing near, and I thought it singular that I heard nothing about her. The necromancer told me that it was quite certain I should find myself where she was, since the devils never break their word when they promise, as they did on that occasion. But he bade me keep my eyes open, and be on the lookout against some accident which might happen to me in that connection, and put restraint upon myself to endure somewhat against my inclination, for he could discern a great and imminent danger in it. Well would it be for me if I went with him to consecrate the book, since this would avert the peril that menaced me, and would make us both most fortunate. I was beginning to hanker after the adventure more than he did, but I said that a certain Maestro Giovanni of Castel Bolognese had just come to Rome, very ingenious in the art of making medals of the sort I made in steel, and that I thirsted for nothing more than to compete with him and take the world by storm with some great masterpiece, which I hoped would annihilate all those enemies of mine by the force of genius and not the sword. The sorcerer on his side went on urging, Nay, prithee, Benvenuto, come with me and shun a great disaster which I see impending over you. However, I had made my mind up, come what would, to finish my medal, and we were now approaching the end of the month. I was so absorbed and enamoured of by my work that I thought no more about Angelica or anything of that kind, but gave my whole self up to it. End of chapter 62 through 65